All right, welcome everyone to uh, our assessment of China's Belt and Road Initiative speaker series. Uh, it's a very um, important uh, session for us because this is the first time after the pandemic that we're meeting in person. Uh, we've had lunch seminars, but this is the first time that we've had uh, some external speaker come in and talk to us. Uh, so it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Galen Martin, uh, who is an assistant professor of geographic science in the School of Integrated Sciences at James Madison University. Uh, he is a human geographer by training, and he has uh, broad research and training interests in the politics of international development. Uh, his ongoing research examines the social and geopolitical implications of infrastructure development across the Himalayas. So he works on the borderland between China, Tibet, uh, and uh, Nepal. Uh, and his research has been published in leading geography journals, including Political Geography, South Asia Journal of South Asian Studies, and Eurasian Geography and Economics. Today, Galen's talk to us about the volumetric presence of China in Nepal, and most of his research is actually based in Nepal as well. So welcome to UVA, uh, Galen. Uh, we have a hybrid, you know, sort of a, right. a pre a presentation today. So we've got people joining in on Zoom, and then you've got the audience over here as well. So welcome to UVA. Thank you. Thank you, Tayab. So I may remove the mask? Yes. Okay. The protocols are always different and changing. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the, the invitation and the opportunity to, to give a talk in person, which we haven't done so much uh, in the past nearly two years. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to, to meet some faculty whose work has been influential to me and in which I've read and to, to visit with some friends from Nepal, no less. So welcome to, to Miguel. Um, so my talk today, uh, I, I hope it speaks well to the BRI, the assessment of China's Belt and Road program here at, at UVA, which I've followed remotely from the other side of the hills uh, at James Madison University, where, where I'm housed. The, the talk I'll give today is a working paper that I'm uh, revising right now for the journal Territory Politics and Governance. So I welcome any and all feedback, um, constructive comments, critique, and, and all sorts of questions. So the talk, let me see which screen to go with here. There we go. Um, is really in, in three parts framed with a, a quick introduction and some preliminary conclusions and future inquiries that I hope can lead into a productive uh, conversation with everyone. So I have some, some key research questions and, and a framework and timeline, and also want to speak to my methods and, and background in Nepal, or why am I here today? The, the central content of, of the talk centers around three aspects of these intersections of material interactions, territorial transformations, and discursive depths. And together, I, I want us to think with these in, in concert with one another in creating what I'm arguing or proposing is a volumetric presence, a three-dimensional presence of China in Nepal through much of its BRI activity, but not only related to the BRI. So I thought uh, this image, which is where much of the talk will, will focus, is a, is a useful site that reflects some of the power asymmetries, which Professor Womack <laughs> works uh, and, and, and has, has written widely on, reflects some of these uh, fundamental power asymmetries between Nepal and China. This is a view of, uh, on the left, a historical fort on the Nepal-China border built by um, Prithvi Narayan Shah to uh, defend against and repel Tibetan invaders from 
uh, centuries ago. On the right hand side is the grand new spectacular customs house and quarantine house that is really reflects a, a popular model of Chinese infrastructure at border sites around, really around China's um, Asian borders. There are very similar looking infrastructures in on the border of uh, Laos and Myanmar and Kazakhstan in Kyrgyzstan in Pakistan. And especially in the case of Nepal, I think this reflects quite well the, the tremendous asymmetries in the current power relationships between Nepal and, and China. So the three questions I will ask and, and I hope answer here today include, how and why has China assumed a new kind of presence in Nepal? And what does this mean across scales from Nepali citizens to South Asian geopolitics? And I'll explain what I mean by presence and why I think that can be a, a productive heuristic for us to analyze these uh, asymmetrical power relations uh, in a moment here. The second question which can help inform this first one is what are the modalities of asymmetrical Chinese power in Nepal? And how do these operate in material, territorial, and discursive ways? And it's these intersections or, or the, the, the configuration of material, territorial, and discursive activity that together comprises this volumetric presence of, of China. And then the third question is, how do development dynamics across the Himalaya reflect broader geopolitical and geoeconomic trends at global levels, especially with respect uh, to the BRI. In other words, why does China matter? Why are we, why am I here talking about it? And what kinds of um, insights can we draw from Nepal to make sense of other Chinese development practices elsewhere in Asia and more broadly around the world? So those are the questions. And now my framework and timeline has a, a particular temporal order here that I want to, or I will talk about this volumetric growth of China's presence in, in Nepal, going back about uh, seven or, or nearly eight years, beginning in 2014. And when there was a, a transformation in China's really material engagements in Nepal, largely with respect to Chinese foreign direct investment, but also advanced through post-earthquake disaster relief and humanitarian aid that operated both in pre and post earthquake contexts. Following this in 2016, up through 2019, there was a significant transformation in territorial or extraterritorial activity of China and Nepal. This was articulated through diplomatic negotiations, trade and transit treaties in particular, then formalized, these were agreements that were formalized into new memoranda of understandings that were then codified in the 2019 Belt and Road Forum and integrated into Nepal's Belt and Road Framework in October of 2019. Building on these material and territorial intersections over the past couple of years, there's been greater depth at the discursive level of China in Nepal. But this is really a paradoxical thing because the use of the Belt and Road is routinely misapplied. And when looking at maps of the Belt and Road, Nepal is almost always missing. So despite these uh, gaps or some of these invisibilities or errors, the discursive presence of Nepal has, has grown it by orders of magnitude in the past couple of years. So I, following these, these lines of thinking, I'll argue that China's volumetric presence in Nepal indexes a recalibration of geopolitics or a new form of what I've called infrastructural relations in South Asia today, a different kind of international relations that are leveraged and met through infrastructural investment and development. Now, conceptually speaking, uh, a few preliminary definitions and, and 
clarifications here. So why talk about territory? So territory, as, as both Robert Sack and, and Stuart Eldon have, have written, is a, can be thought of as a bundle of political techniques employed to measure land and control terrain. Territory isn't just space that exists within the sovereign boundaries of a given state, but it's actually a practice and a technique of controlling land, I'm sorry, of measuring land, controlling terrain, and conducting the conduct of the populations that live there. But territory is often conceived of, in, in fact, even measured in two-dimensional contexts. In 2013, Stuart Eldon uh, authored a paper of, in political geography on securing the volume and argued that increasingly state efforts at national but also international scales operate in more dimensions than the, the two-dimensional. It's not just spatial practice over areas on land, but also underground, under the sea, in the sky, in space, three and even four dimensional operations of, of power are the volumetric. Four dimensional being investments into the future, incorporating time into the concerns of, of state and interstate power. Now I'm adding presence to these concepts to create this, to create a heuristic to index a form of power and visibility that's experienced materially, territorially, discursively, asymmetrically. So across the Himalaya, presence constitutes an influential force with transnational impact that helps to explain how China is seen and received in Nepal. The so what? Why are we talking about the volumetric here? Well, I think this type of lens can shed a, a different sort of in a productive multi-dimensional light on the political and social impacts of infrastructure development today. So before going into the, the more empirical analysis here, I want to speak a bit on my methods and background and, and what I've been, been doing in Nepal. So I've, I've been doing research in the region for a couple of decades now primarily in Nepal, but also in, in Tibet and the broader Himalayan region. And that has largely been observations about the impacts of Chinese development long before the BRI was articulated or even imagined by, um, by Xi Jinping. And in particular, this area that where I showed the forts and the customs house at the border of Kirong, I walked through the area in 2000. And at that time, Chinese labor teams were just building a road up to the border of Nepal. And it was a, an expedition of sorts leaving Tibet. My, my late friend here, uh, Julian Paul Green and I got stuck in Tibet and we were trying to get out and get to Nepal. And we on the map, we could see a river that penetrated the Himalayan Gorge. And so we followed that river down. Uh, we unfortunately were apprehended by the Public Security Bureau and locked in this room closet at the local administrative offices until being sent away and sent off to Nepal the next day. This incidentally is the centerpiece of, of China's BRI framework and development program to Nepal. This, is, this was the police post or the public security bureau post where the, the spectacularly imagined Kiran Kathmandu Railroad will pass through. This is now designated as the primary trade corridor between Nepal and China. But in 2000, it was just an old historical town that had long-standing trade relations with Nepal, but no road connections, no viable trans-border um, or, or scale up uh, capacity for, for trans-border um, economic activity, but something was afoot. And I was, was quite curious about that. And so I've been paying attention to and, and inquiring on these very things since then. Following these experiences in, in 2000, in 2008 and 2014, doing master's and, and PhD research in Nepal, as well as in Lhasa, Tibet, and other spots of central Tibet, I was able to travel along the friendship highways between Nepal and China and observe the 
along these um, routes, key, key points and practices in the transformation of Sino and Nepali relations. This is also when protests erupted across the Tibetan plateau in, in 2008, and new security measurements were, were implemented in Nepal over, Nepal over Tibetan populations at the request of the Chinese embassy in, in Kathmandu. In 2018 and 2019, more recently, I was in Kathmandu when the second Belt and Road Forum was taking place in, uh, in Beijing. And Nepal's president, uh, Bibya Devi Bhandari, had, had visited. And then her visit to, to China was followed by Xi Jinping's high profile state level visit to Nepal. She is the, the first Chinese uh, president to, to visit Nepal in, in many decades. And at this moment, attention to and enthusiasm of the Belt and Road reached new heights. Of course, for the past couple of years, it hasn't been possible to, to return to Nepal to do research. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to put uh, constraints on us. So my research since then has been more remote, including discursive analysis and interviews with, with colleagues and informants in Nepal in, in a more remote setting. It's also worth saying I have a, a, I've long felt a connection to UVA and that my late friend Paul was a PhD student in the Department of Religion here uh, in about 15 years ago when he passed away. And I, he was working with David Germano, which, which uh, my friend and colleague Miguel does as well. So I've, I've had a, a, an interesting connection with UVA since that time, and which makes it especially uh, poignant to be here talking about this today. So providing some more geographic context of the talk. These are the roads that, that I'll, I'll bring us to here today. This is where we were locked in the broom closet and where the railroad is scheduled to go or imagined to be developed through Kerong into Rasua. This is the historic highway, the Friendship or Arnico Highway connecting Kathmandu and Lhasa, Tibet that was built in the 1960s. Development of this was initiated in one of the first bilateral agreements in early terms of, of international relations and infrastructural relations between Nepal and China. And over here, further to the west, is the third uh, road that I will attend to today, going through Mustang, a, a culturally and ethnically Tibetan area further west in, in Nepal, where new dry ports, uh, in addition to roads and other infrastructures, are being developed or imagined to be developed, both as part of uh, not yet part of Nepal's DRI framework, but part of other infrastructure and development programs that actually have been advanced more completely than BRI projects themselves. So by way of that long-winded introduction, let me get to the content here. So the material interactions in 2014 and 2015. So in 2014, Chinese foreign direct investment to Nepal exceeded Indian FDI for the first time ever. This prefigured Nepal's or Beijing's largest ever humanitarian operation in response to the earthquakes in Nepal in 2015 in April and May, augmented by a, a $750 million pledge at the International Donors Conference. In 2015, Chinese aid packages to Nepal's 14 northern border districts were also expanded significantly. So material interventions in largesse was directed towards ethnically and culturally Tibetan regions that then was followed by emergency fuel relief and some important new vectors of Sino-Nepali connectivity. 
So I'll talk, I'll walk us through these events a, a bit more deliberately here. So in, no, in early December of, of 2014, here we're back at the, the gatehouse in Huron. The This road, bridge, and border was opened in a high profile event with Nepal's Consular General to Lhasa, Hari Prasad Bashyal, and Dong Ming Jun, the Vice Chairman of the TAR, as with many other dignitaries. This event followed quickly upon um, the, the period at, at, at which Chinese FDI eclipsed Indian FDI for the first time. In the Nepali press and amongst the population, there was a new type of anticipation, enthusiasm of trade and opportunities, uh, economic, educational, energy related uh, connectivities with China and a beginning of a turn or a pivot away from Kathmandu's longstanding relation or de relations of dependency with India. Several months later, earthquakes struck Nepal. The 25th of April and the 12th of May, first a 7.8 magnitude earthquake followed by a 7.3 magnitude earthquake. And these disrupted really everything in Nepal. They disrupted geopolitical relations between Kathmandu, Beijing, and Delhi. They disrupted longstanding patterns of humanitarian relief and development aid across the country. They disrupted the national political climate and accelerated the promulgation of a controversial new constitution. They also disrupted social relations and community service organizations as people waited and waited for help that was slow to arrive. In many ways, and in view of many Nepalis, China came to the rescue. Oops. Some of these forms of, of earthquake aid were food, rice, material goods in the borderlands. Much else was, was China's Red Cross providing emergency shelter and uh, relief efforts for internally displaced people. And most of all was the operational activity of Chinese hydropower construction to clear roads, to reopen Nepal, uh, reopen Nepal's borders with China and get goods moving once again. Hydropower equipment was deployed here in Rasua along the Kirong Kathmandu Road, as well as in along the Friendship Highway. Chinese capacity for development was demonstrated to also be a tremendous capacity for emergency relief. This was also a period of, of territorialization of Nepali space. This is a, an image of a World Food Program uh, aerial organization for, for relief operations. And it's an image I took at a, at a meeting of uh, emergency, uh, emergency organizations at the Nepal Army Club. And it, it shows some of the, this territorialization of Nepali space and how China was officially designated for operations in these northern areas, which is precisely where the new roads, well, the historic road and the new roads run. Now, following this, these aerial earthquake relief efforts, and the opening of, of the road borders with Chinese assets. And later in 2015, Nepal's southern border with India was, was blockaded. 
anti-constitution protests in, in the South turned violent and resulted in blockades and trade embargoes at Nepal's border crossing with India. This was largely, um, uh, by many accounts, uh, influenced if not implemented by the blockade itself by Indian officials in New Delhi in sympathy and in solidarity with ne ethnic populations in southern Nepal of, of the Medesi group who are both Hindu and maintain long-standing cultural and kinship ties with populations on the Indian side of the border in, in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh and other states of India. What this blockade did was, was close all of Nepal's roadways for the import of fuel, for construction materials, for earthquake relief that was coming from South Asia, from including Calcutta and Delhi, where major relief, major volumes and quantity of relief goods were to be sourced. Well, the government of Nepal quickly blamed the blockade fuel crisis on Indian leadership, Chinese interventions made a highly symbolic but largely nominal act of fuel relief with the delivery of 12 petrol tankers from Tibet in, in November 2015. So while 1,000 tons of fuel is ultimately a drop in the bucket of Nepal's overall fuel needs, it was highly symbolic and, and unprecedented. You need to move. I just need to move. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this move ended a four decade long monopoly of the Indian Oil Corporation as the fuel supplier to Nepal. And it led to further talks for importing fuel via the Rasuagadi Huron Corp. Okay, I can I can do any, any of Yeah, anyway, join. Okay. So, okay. No problem. Here. there we go. So this was the end of 2015 when this fuel delivery came, which further marked this pivot for leadership in Kathmandu and many of Nepal's international relations away from New Delhi and towards Beijing. In 2016, these material transformations took new um, shape in territorial ways. As I mentioned before, in April, um, I'm sorry, the, the, before we get to these photos, in April 2016, Nepal's Prime Minister KP Oli made a state level visit to Beijing. And, and this began the formulation and the framework for the Nepal's, and he presented Nepal's proposals for BRI projects. These were then refined, revised, and, and then newly articulated between Nepal's president Bandari during her visit with Xi at the second Belt and Road Forum in April 2019, and then further advanced, and in, in fact, these territorial measures compounded by Xi's visit to Nepal in the fall of 2019. So again, this furthers this paradigm shift of new Sino-Nepali aid and trade policies. So in 2016, 2017, Chinese FDI, again, was the greatest um, that Nepal received, exceeding 60% of its, its total FDI in 2015 and, and growing even further in 2016. Then in 2016, the Beijing Kathmandu issued a joint statement 
and a transit trade treaty. This is when infrastructural and economic connectivity was first and very clearly connected with Nepal's subscription to and observation of and enforcement of China's one China, of Beijing's one China policy and attention to extradition agreements of, of Chinese Tibetan populations in Nepal. In 2017 and 2018, new aid and loan packages, as well as railroad and energy planning were further advanced. This included a continuation or rather a renewal of the five-year food aid plans, but also early one belt, one road, and then belt and road project plan. In 2018 and 2019, this was codified in new ways through the Belt and Road Forum and the Belt and Road programs. Most clearly articulated in the Nepal, well, clear may not be the right word because it's a mouthful. Um, most enthusiastically in the Nepal-China trans-Himalayan multidimensional connectivity network. So what was going on with these joint statements and transit treaties? Now, I realize there's too much text on these on the screen here, but I want to point your attention what is here in red, which is which is this articulation of these are infrastructural relations, this connection between infrastructure development, aid, and and security agreements. So in, in part three, the two sides reiterated their firm commitment to respect each other's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity respect and accommodate each other's concerns and core interests. The Nepalese side reiterated its commitment to one China policy. Part five, both sides agreed to synergize each other's development planning, formulate appropriate bilateral, bilateral cooperation programs and to carry out major projects under the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative. Both sides agreed to strengthen connectivity, further step up the land and air links and improve the land transport infrastructure. Part six, the Chinese government will continue to provide assistance to Nepal's socioeconomic development, support the post-disaster reconstruction of Nepal to carry out 25 key projects in areas covering infrastructure construction, recovery of people's livelihood and quake-stricken areas of northern Nepal. Eight, both sides agreed to conclude a commercial deal on the supply of petroleum products from China to Nepal. And part nine, both sides agreed to negotiate treaty on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters and treaty on extradition in order to strengthen operation on the administration of border areas and fight against illegal border crossing. So these, this pairing of, of aid, earthquake reconstruction, new infrastructure development, including BRI projects, and, and Nepal's commitment to address or, or attend to China's concerns over population, Tibetan populations outside of Nepal's borders. Law, a, a source of longstanding anxiety for Beijing and through agreements and then more formal forms of this, such as the MOUs I'll get to in another minute here, an indication of how Beijing is able to exercise territory or territoriality or operate extraterritorially outside the limits of the PRC. So following these 15 point agreements in the trade and transit um, treaties, Nepal uh, formulated nine key Belt and Road projects. And this, this is what was agreed upon uh, at, the, at the second Belt and Road Forum. Up ro upgrading a number of roads, building new roads, as well as transmission lines, hydroelectric projects, energy, energy concerns, transportation concerns, then the railroad and as the BRI is more than just infrastructure projects, also a technical university named after Madan Bandari, an early uh, communist leader in Nepal. 
Now, a number of these projects fit into, again, this Nepal-China trans-Himalayan multidimensional connectivity network. This is meant as this, again, multidimensional system of connecting Nepal and China via roads, rails, and energy corridors, or what elsewhere I've called power corridors. Now, the, most of these BRI projects, in fact, follow or, or advance Nepal's own strategic roads network. These orange lines here indicate the, the primary roads comprising the strategic road network that are meant as uh, na national pride projects that connect Nepal's northern areas over the Chinese <clears throat> with, uh, I'm sorry, into Chinese Tibet. President Bhandari at the second Belt and Road Forum drew attention to the, this network in saying the development of the Trans-Himalayan Multidimensional Connectivity Network, including the Nepal-China Cross-Border Railway, will boost connectivity not only between Nepal and China, but other countries in the region. After a prolonged political transition, Nepal has achieved political stability. Our objective ahead is to bring about visible transformation in the living standard of our people. Attaching this connectivity network in its place in the larger BRI framework to the, the modernization of the country, bring about this, this transformation in living standards. In Nepal, this is articulated as bikas, or development or modernity that's both material and infrastructural, but also discursive. It, it's, an, it's an imaginary, a, a form of, um, a, a, a form of aspiration. From his side, she responded with his own articulation of advancing China-Nepal friendship. Just before his visit in October of 2019, he referred to Nepal as this friendly neighbor and all recognizing that the visit would be his first it was somewhere that he'd long wanted to come to Nepal and see for myself its majestic mountains and rivers and unique culture. I have also met in China visiting Nepali leaders on many occasions and developed with them a deep friendship. I now very much look forward to stepping on this wonderful land to renew friendship and explore cooperation with my Nepali friends. We hope we can together draw up a new blueprint for our bilateral ties. In addition to Kathmandu City being um, emblazoned with, with profiles of, of Xi and Bandari and, and much warm welcome, much of the blueprint for these new bilateral ties raised great concern for much of Nepal's population in the northern border areas, again, which are largely culturally and ethnically Tibetan, where much of this development is taking place. Again, the red here highlights that which is part of this infrastructural relationship, infrastructure development, international trade, and state security. Treaties between Nepal and the PRC on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters. The MOU between the Ministry of Physical Infrastructure and Transport of Nepal and the Ministry of Transport of the PRC on feasibility studies of the Nepal-China cross-border railway project. Further disaster risk reduction and emergency responses. MOUs on the establishment of joint working groups on trade earthquake monitoring projects, and of course the exchange of letters for border security equipment, office equipment. Increasing security mechanisms in the Northern areas. So from 2016 to 2019, in more official ways in bilateral agreements and memoranda of understanding 
in Belt and Road frameworks, the connection between Chinese aid, investment in development projects, implementation of infrastructures, and Nepal's commitment to meeting China's security concerns became more closely integrated. Now, in the, in the final few minutes here, I want to look at the ways in which this relationship has, has grown even deeper, but how it really has happened in discursive ways. And this, this discursive relationship is fundamentally paradoxical. And that the Belt and Road is widely articulated in Nepal as an unprecedented promise of development and connectivity. Yet virtually no material BRI work has been completed to date in Nepal. Meanwhile, dozens of projects not BRI related are often and erroneously called Belt and Road. And second, although the BRI has, has a conspicuous presence in Nepal, Discursively, people talk about it in the word, the use of the BRI gets work done for politicians, for contractors, for enterprises, state-owned and otherwise. BRI projects across the Himalaya are almost always absent from Belt and Road maps. So Belt and Road maps have this useful fuzziness that allow the BRI to appear both inevitable and flexible. And I question, and I don't think it's only uh, coincidental or ironic that BRI projects aren't necessarily illustrated in these culturally and ethnically Tibetan areas. So what do these paradoxes do in geopolitically sensitive spaces? And how does discursive power resolve some of the tensions and fill gaps between material objectives and territorial outcomes? So these are projects that have been completed in Nepal since the earthquake, and particularly since 2019, but none of them are, are Belt and Road. This, you can't see it over the, the video um, block there, but it says China aid in Nepal's northern borderlands, but not BRI. So the development of this major dry port in Larcha along the Friendship Highway, which is a model dry port, that's being replicated in many other areas, including uh, Mustang, where I work, has been a Chinese post-disaster project. The, the rebuilding and restoration of the Friendship Bridge, the connecting point between Nepal and China along the historic Friendship Highway, also a China aid project, not a Belt and Road project. Improvements and repairs to the Friendship Highway, the Arunakko Highway, not Belt and Road projects. And yet, in Kathmandu, by policy analysts, in academic papers I read, these very projects are routinely called Belt and Road. Chinese development in Nepal, Chinese post-disaster reconstruction and relief, the tremendous capacity for China to build things quickly and relatively efficiently are, uh, um, th that capacity is often associated with these projects. And these projects are called Belt and Road, even though there are no such things. So Chinese development and Chinese infrastructure development in Nepal is largely not Belt and Road. And yet the Belt and Road is the word, the rhetorical device, the platform by which other political work gets done. So these are projects in borderland northern areas. In Kathmandu, in the capital city, many other Chinese development projects, earthquake um, reconstruction, investment and development of, of new business enclaves in, in Kathmandu are also not BRI projects. Repairs to the Hanuman Doka Palace in Kathmandu's Basantapur, the develop or the, the reconstruction repair of the historic Durbar High School, and the expansion of, of Kathmandu's Chinatown and Jata also are not Belt and Road projects. But Chinese development 
and the Belt and Road are rhetorically often synonymous in Nepal. And I question why, why is that? What work gets done by enunciating the BRI? It generates backing, sometimes it curry favors, it can generate trust with constituents. Often the BRI gets work done in name alone, even when BRI projects don't, uh, don't happen. So the actual BRI projects in Nepal that are most important, the railroad coming from Tehran, this reflects what's imagined to be some of this multi-dimensional connectivity network, and another rendering of the, of the railroad. This work hasn't, hasn't happened. And it's not only because of, of COVID. Chinese officials have, have not been able to come to terms, well, have, have not completed the environmental impact assessment to such a point at which the financial modalities can be agreed upon for this type of development. As Tayab has, has written about, the, the bureaucratic obstacles are really standing in the way of implementation, but so are shifting tides of political alliances. As Maoist leadership tends to be more closely aligned with Beijing, whereas Nepali Congress leadership is more closely aligned with Delhi. Now this railroad is, uh, has spectacular discursive power in Nepal, and that it's imagined to, as an opportunity to scale up trade, economic relations, connectivity between Nepal and China. It's $2 billion uh, estimate or expenditure estimate will include about 200 kilometers of track, nine, over 90% of which is anticipated to be bridges and tunnels across seismically active terrain. This is where the earthquakes of 2015 took place. So many questions abound and virtually no work has been completed to date. And yet the Belt and Road continues to be a big thing in Nepal. Despite this, this discursive traction that the Belt and Road has in Nepal, when we look at larger or more popular maps of the Belt and Road, the Tibetan Plateau, the Himalayan region, and Nepal itself are altogether absent or missing. Merricks, the, the research group in, in Germany, and the Light in Asia Center out of the Netherlands illustrate what most BRI maps show, the six main economic corridors, right? Eurasian land bridge, CPEC is a little faint there. I'm surprised by that, Tayab. The, the Bangladesh, uh, China, India, Myanmar, um, and of course, some of the, the maritime roads as well. But areas that are actually hugely important to broader Belt and Road activity are left off the map. So a variety of these maps, not just by Light in Asia Center and Merricks, depict this usefully approximate but inexact network of roads and rails and sea lanes and other transport infrastructures to represent something called China's Belt and Road. But for a global infrastructure program that reflects and advances Beijing's ambitions to lead and transform new models of international development, BRI maps remain surprisingly imprecise and, and unofficial. In fact, there is no official map of the BRI. Despite impressive GIS capabilities, the Belt and Road portal, Beijing's own Belt and Road uh, mouthpiece, fails to map its eponymous self. So more, some more recent maps uh, published by the World Bank render this region in the same way. Virtually nothing 
coming through here. So in Nepal, the BRI is, a, is still a big deal, even though much isn't being done. And in, in broader cartographic representations, those BRI agreements, BRI projects as promised and envisioned are still left off the maps. So what are these paradoxes? In 2020 and 2021, BRI projects were suspended in Nepal, but the great progress was made on China aid projects. So there's been this reproduction of, of discursive power. I wonder, will new maps include new projects? COVID-19 has complicated the BRI implementation, but other Chinese development continues. And from looking ahead, as we enter 2022 and onwards, what might be down this, this road ahead? We can continue to observe this Chinese presence in the local in particular, as it's somehow often, maybe this is why so many of us are intrigued or the BRI has, has garnered so much attention that it can be both conspicuous and invisible at the same time. As colleagues and I wrote a couple years ago, China's BRI is not a monolithic program designed in Beijing and impose upon others. Rather, it's better understood as a bundle of intertwined discourses, policies, and projects that sometimes align and are sometimes contradictory. And just to, to wrap it up here, although many BRI projects appear dead on the ground in a material sense, a closer examination shows that BRI agreements help accomplish other territorial work often advanced through discursive means. So while the actual infrastructures or material commitments of China's BRI program to Nepal may well never get built, who knows if this railroad is gonna come together. The extraterritorial impacts or apparatuses of bilateral state security, observance of the one China policy and agreements extradition are already very much effectively in force. Ask any Tibetans and most of Nepal's northern population about that, and, and there's no, uh, no uncertainty about those types of BRI impacts thus far. So this then raises another paradox. So even if territorial outcomes may be more successful than the material initiatives, it's attention to the latter material aspects of Chinese development that remain conspicuous and potent. That, that's what the political promises are, are made of. That's, the, that's what the global attention focuses on. That's what the many reports coming out of think tanks and, and academic institutions produce. But while the former territorial practices are far less obvious to all but those most directly impacted. But it's not only in Nepal that this is taking place. This handshake across the Himalayas, which really um, has grown closer and tighter since 2016, is now looking more like a form of surveillance. As Himal magazine called it, the trap of surveillance. So, and lastly, why does this matter? Why, why look at a small state like Nepal, who very much looks to, to China as an alternative to longstanding dependencies on India and decades of failed Western development? What's happening in Nepal matters across space and scale. Although just a, one relatively small state neighboring China and South Asia, the material, territorial, and discursive processes at work there resonate with similar dynamics of Chinese investment and development across the world. So I think a volumetric lens can help us reveal or, or consider more critically how these processes operate in our experience in multiple dimensions, both in tension and in concert with one another. And in conversation with other cases within and beyond Nepal, much of, many of which have been part of your, your previous assessment of the BRI talks here at UVA, 
I hope that this study can join an expanding chorus that addresses the uneven intersections of BRI development, but that also attends to China's expansive presence in broader global contexts. So with that, I will um, open it up to questions from all of you and, and from our audience here via Zoom and thank a, you again, Tayeb, for inviting Wells, for, for those of you that came out on a Friday evening uh, before Thanksgiving break. So thank you very much. Shall I unmute it here? I will be, be Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I also want to thank Brian for all of your support and assistance and, and coordination. Well, as Tayab is queuing that up, any, any questions from anyone here? I did have a question. I'm a little bit curious about the historical relationship between Nepal and China. Has this been like a divergence? And how does that relate to the recent uh, tension between the US and China? Great. Um, good. Yeah, sorry. That's part of uh, the, the first part of my paper, but I'm sorry I didn't get into that here today. So in 1961 or 1962, Kathmandu and Beijing formalized their, their border which was the first step in, in more formal relationships between Nepal and China. In the 19, prior to the 1950s and prior to the um, communist revolution in China, there, there were diplomatic relationships, but it wasn't as, as formalized as, as it has become in, in the modern era. Starting in 1962, that border uh, formalization and demarcation then led to, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the treaty, but that committed, uh, China committed to helping Nepal develop this uh, friendship highway, the Arnico Highway, that then led the way for closer, uh, closer relations in, in Chinese investment and development projects, but this was all during the Cold War period. So, Though Nepal did receive Chinese aid and, and development projects, the, the broader relationship was under the, under the Nepali monarchy, as well as the Panchayat period, this, this interregnum period was, was not as close with the Chinese um, Communist Party. Nepal's civil war from the mid-1990s to 2016 Mao's revolutionaries take control. The monarchy ends in 2008. Political leadership is avowedly Maoist, and the, the Communist Party of Nepal has much closer ties with the Communist Party of China. So since 2006, Nepal-China relationships have been even closer. And at the same time, Nepal's relationship with India while it's long been complicated and for a long time been quite strained, there, through investment and infrastructural connections with China, Nepal has, or the leadership in Nepal has been able to pivot or extract itself from some of these longer relationships with, with India and, and look to China for delivery of aid, sometimes symbolic, like. The, like the fuel, sometimes quite um, effective, such as the, the earthquake relief in, in the opening of the roads. And in recent years, it's been characterized by major collaborative projects in hydropower development. But while there are many agreements and many MOUs, as the, the, the progress or lack thereof of the BRI projects reflects, Actually, getting the work done is another matter all, altogether. So the relationship between Kathmandu and Beijing is much, much closer, but the actual completion or implementation of many of those projects has not progressed as much as many people had hoped. But Beijing is viewed as sort of this alternative to the longstanding and complicated dependency on India and 
dependencies and um, I guess problems with Western development models in that Nepal's experience since the 1950s as well. Professor, I just have the detail question. You mentioned the formalization of the border was 6162, so before the China India border was correct on both sides, correct, but particularly on the, on the west side. Yeah, yeah, I. I believe so. Outside Chin was 1962, right? Yeah. yeah, right. And and also in Arunachal Pradesh. Right. And so the the well, primarily in, yeah, yeah. right road development in Outside Chin, but then the war in Arunachal Pradesh. I'm good. Uh, was uh, well, if you're talking about the war being the battle, there was at least other Outside Chin. So on both sides. I've seen the monument. There. Right. Right. So right. The the the. the Formalization of the border took time because it was it was walked in there are a series of I I should know the number off, but I'm blank on it right now. 50 some border marker pillars that that designate demarcate the Nepal China border. And that took quite some time to actually implement. But the agreement to formalize that border took place in between 61 and 62. Incidentally, that's quite similar to the formalization and delineation of the China Vietnam border. Right. It's also done with stone pillars. The agreement in principle, December 2000, and then over the next two years, we have the certification of the extension, even though they made it back to the Okay, I didn't know in, in Vietnam that the, the process was concurrent at at the time. Oh, yeah. So I I I'm, I'm, do you know if was that a trend emanating from Beijing at that time? Do you think, for example, China's borders with Mongolia or with Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan in these areas which are historically very pastoralist, the borders were for a long time more whether you call them frontier or a boundary, were more fluid, right? With the yeah. populations similar to in with Nepal and Chinese Tibet. And then it was only in this you know, state formalization period following the revolution that they were formalizing Nepal. So I'm curious if, if yeah. in the China's other borders, if that maybe first half of the 1960s yeah, was the- Yeah, in Pakistan as well. So yeah. the Pakistan one was around that time as well. Right. In the uh, late 50s, early 60s. Okay. Yeah. My impression is that you have two basic periods of border delineation. The first would be more vague and handshake, so that the, the border should be peaceful. Right. Would be in the 50s. But from 1979 to 80 on, you have, again, collaboration on border. Uh, Vietnam was delayed on that by the China Vietnam War. Where the formal cause was border dispute. Okay. Or it wasn't the real um, But that was made the, the settlement of the border where actually major battles had taken place as late as 1987. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Made the settlement of the border. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, thank, thank you very much uh, for this very informative talk. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, maybe a form that I think the precursor to the so called China's DRI project was really internally in China mm -hmm. the development of infrastructure in the right. Now, I was able to travel to Tibet in 2019, and, and just this is still within China's border, but the developments are uh, really quite uh, uh, effective. Right. So uh, on the one hand, the uh, developments of age in Nepal seems to be kind of an extension just across the board. Mm -hmm. So whether you name it as CRI or not, maybe, I think you pointed out a uh, very, very, very good point that China's kind of a territorial extension or interest at least, but maybe it's, they, they view it as a kind of extension of what's already occurred across the border, so they didn't really know this as the mm -hmm. So that's one, one question. And then the second one, in Nepal, as you mentioned, uh, 
uh, the people are ethnic and culturally closer to the Tibetan. Do they sympathize with the Tibetan criticism of the Chinese government, particularly its oppressive of religion, and also kind of an erasure of their own cultural identity? So how, how do you? Good, good, great questions. Right. I, I would say that China's development program in Nepal is very much an extension of whether it's Shiva the Kaifa and going west and then going out, right? Which my um, PhD supervisor, Emily Ye, has written widely on the, the going west and then yes. going out. So we see is ERI really just a reformulation of this, of this trend going further west and further out. In many, in, in sort of a segue into answering the second part of the question, many in people whom I've talked to in, in Nepal's northern border areas who are ethnically or culturally or political exiles of, of Tibetans will say, look what happened in Tibet. We saw that. Look what's happening now in, in Nepal. I mean, this may be a fairly fatalistic view, but there's a real anxiety of this expansive Chinese power into these areas that happen to be ethnically and culturally Tibetan. Now, also, this sort of goes back to one of, of your questions, Brian. In the 1960s, which is, was also a complicated aspect of the border area, the guerrilla forces, the Chushi Kangdra, that were fighting the, the People's Liberation Army, had their headquarters in northern Nepal and were, were trained and supported by the US CIA. And so that period had a complicated Nepal's relationship with China, for sure, but there's still legacies of those guerrilla resistance movements, particularly you know, the uh, descendants of, of that population in some of these northern border areas, which it would seem that authorities from Beijing and Nepal's embassy in Kathmandu are still fairly concerned about. Now, Nepal's ethnically and culturally Tibetan or Tibetan Buddhist population is a small fraction of Nepal's 30 some million people. Spatially, it's 30% of the country. And you know, Miguel knows more about much of this universe than, than I can speak knowledgeably to. Spatially, it's 30% of the country, but the population wise is, is a small percentage. But if you go into the capital city, and, and where Miguel has, has lived and worked for a long time, in the Tibetan enclaves of, of the capital, which feel very much like, um, well, in many ways are very much like parts of Lhasa, not just the density of, of Tibetan communities and monasteries and, and pilgrimage and trade practices, but now the surveillance mechanisms and supervisions. And, and there's a lot of conversation and conjecture, but I think also reality to people saying there are Chinese spies or there's Nepalis who are spies, there's surveillance that is being reported to the Chinese embassy in Kathmandu and the you know the authorities in, in Beijing. So there's a there's a real concern that then it's a form of governmentality, right? It's conducting the, the movement in the conduct of people themselves who, who are Tibetan and concerned about the Chinese eyes watching over them. Which is, I guess, also a connection to going west and going out, right? People, some people say, this part of Kathmandu feels like Lhasa, where we left. We're being watched and we don't even know whom or where or what's watching us, but we know it's, it's happening. Professor Lama? How do the non ethnic Tibetans, I mean, it seems to me it'd be worth differentiating the attitude toward China. First of all, yeah. I think that the Tibetans, the Tibetans uh, localized non exile Tibetans uh, versus uh, Tibetans in exile in Kathmandu and elsewhere. Now, I've seen them there too, uh, but I haven't been in the village as much as that. As far as the communist connection goes, that raises a whole different dimension of right. similarities and differences. I doubt it. I doubt it. The Tibetans are that involved in the uh, Nepali communist movement. 
Right. Yeah, the Tibetan populations don't have a, a whole lot of political clout in, in Nepal. And you're, you're absolutely correct in that differentiating the multiple demographics going on here. The, the Nepal's much larger Hindu population, <clears throat> certainly much of that feels differently about relationships with New Delhi than some in Kathmandu. Many in, in Kathmandu who are not Tibetan, are not from Northern borderland districts, are not <clears throat> part of Tibetan Buddhist cultural milieus, don't necessarily have some of the same apprehensions, concerns, and anxieties with them, insofar as Nepal having a closer relationship with China now. Some Tibetans who have you know, there are, there are plenty of Tibetans who actually, well, not plenty, but some who are repatriating to China because of economic opportunity there. So there, I mean, there's such differentiation that we could, there's no end to it, I suppose, right? That brings me another question. That is the current economic level in Tibet and sort of the uh, prospects that an, an individual young person might have there versus Nepal. Yeah. Well, I, I read that a lot of Nepali in, in Lhasa. Absolutely. Because their English is better. There are, and, and you, there are many Tibetans and Nepalis and, you know, young men and young women who are Indian citizens, but their families are from Himachal or Ladakh or Kinur, or they're from that Himalayan world, and they've returned or moved to Lhasa because of their multilingual English Mandarin, you know, Hindi Nepali and, and many others and have great job opportunities as a function of you know Beijing's incredible investment and subsidization of development in, in the TAR, right? The the railroad that I'm talking about or was talking about here is of course an extension of the the Shanghai Tibet Railway that had been extended to Shigatse when I was in Tibet in 2014. Now we think, I think it goes just about to Kirong, but I don't wow. know quite where it is. It had gone to and past Latse, but the plan was for that to go down into Kirong and then extend into Nepal. And maybe a Western line would also go out to Mount Kailash and the Aksai Chin, which is convenient both for a few, you know, can move some tourists, but can move a lot of military um, goods as well. And perhaps link up to cash Yep. Yes. Um, I think it's where yes. I think that I think it's subtle. And by that I mean that which has there's the spectacular in, in the big promotions, the railways, the bridges. I mean, whether it's CPEC or the Hamadota port in Sri Lanka or the you know our new Arctic Sea Route. I mean, there's the big projects that garner a lot of attention. But then there's more um, delicate, but I think also more deliberate aspects to it as, as well. And <clears throat> I'm not suggesting that um, it's some sort of debt trap diplomacy. I think um, Deborah Brogan writes very wisely against, against that. But I think in a territorial sense or in areas that have, that Beijing has real anxieties about, ethnic minority agitation that can threat, threaten the homeland or that can um, challenge the one China policy, then BRI projects have, or that, that's what I, I'm trying to say here, have a different kind of calculus that has an extraterritorial concern. It would be really a, a Beijing exercising some sovereign power over subject populations outside of the PRC. And you can see that with respect to Uyghurs that may be in Kazakhstan or that usually have a more fluid mobility between Kazakhstan and in Xinjiang. 
as well as Turkic populations in, in Kyrgyzstan um, and Uyghurs in Pakistan. In Sost, we were talking about the northern parts of the Karakoram Highway and development up there. And, and so I, I think there's a, a particular calculus for the BRI that's respective and contextual for, for the various countries that these projects go in. As we, I think we're well aware of, the BRI isn't this one size fits all project or program, even though it's sometimes viewed as such. But it, it, it actually takes these really particular, or it's articulated and calculated in particular ways in, in, in different places. Did I screw that up? Yeah. Good. So, I, I, so there was a picture that was very interesting that you showed where a camera is next to the picture of the Nepali president and, the, and President Xi Jinping. Is that do they have a safe city project in Nepal as well? So that's one of the ways in which the the kind of extraterritorial power that you're talking about is being exercised through these safe city projects mm. across different parts of the world. And the camera that was there, that was a CCTV camera. So I would I was just wondering. Right, if that's, uh, and uh, that's a good question. And I, I, to be honest, I don't know if it's part of that safe city. Um, framework or constellation yet in a formal sense, but my, my, if I had to guess, I would say yes. Um, but I'm not, I, I, I don't know if it's, if it's part of that. That, that fits into your, your whole theory yeah. about extraterritoriality, because more than these, uh, I think with the emergence of technologies, especially these global champions like Huawei, et cetera, mm -hmm more than spies on the ground it is these sort of tools right. of information technology that are now going to be linked to and that sort of fits into your conception of state building as well mm -hmm. because it fits both the it takes both the boxes right it helps beijing you know with its own uh, fears over these populations or ethnic uh, tibetan populations mm -hmm. in nepal but it also helps the nepalese government itself you know sort of keep tabs on its own citizens. Right. So from that sort of hegemony, hegemony of violence sort of a perspective, these sort of technologies actually fit in very well with your uh, right. views about BRI being a broader thing rather than you know brick and mortar itself, but more for discursive mm -hmm. angle views as well. And actually to, to follow up on your question, Victoria, I think the digital Silk Road, that dimension of the, the grand belt and road schemes is a huge part of or, or ties in with these territorial concerns and territorial practices as, as well, whether it's you know 5G networks or Huawei or the closed circuit TV cameras that are, are more ubiquitous around Kathmandu now, or maybe a form of the, the Skynet or, or the other AI-driven surveillance software that, that China has demonstrated a, a real capacity for, for developing and implementing. It's, I'd only be able to speculate what will, what the digital Silk Road will entail, but there's certainly opportunity to implement all of that. But as Job points out here, Nepal and Kathmandu exercises a lot of agency of, it, of its own here. It's not just a recipient of Chinese largesse or it's not bring the BRI to me. There's real, they're very savvy political campaigns, platforms, manipulations, negotiations, exploitations in Kathmandu playing Nepal or playing Delhi and Beijing off of one another, as well as inviting particular, um, in inviting Chinese actors to develop or implement particular projects that meet their interests, but also build Nepal's capacity to, well, just to expand its state presence. And that is both infrastructural, material, but it's also ideological. It's, it's bring modernity to peripheral areas in the borderlands that have been largely neglected by the state for the past hundred years or forever. Yeah, I really like your idea of, of, of presence and, and multi-dimensional presence. And I wonder if I could ask you to add a dimension to that because mm. it puzzles me. 
I'm really familiar, I'm more familiar with the Southeast Asian border areas and whatever. And the material aspect of Chinese presence is almost overwhelming in, say, northern Vietnam, actually, all of Vietnam, right now, um, and Laos and Thailand, you know, the products from China. Mm -hmm. But then again, they have much better access to China than, than, uh, than Tibet would before the railroad. And, right. and the, of course, the Nepal would. I'm wondering, I, they have. Such a resource in India for the types of products that Southeast Asia buys from China. Uh, is there a shift of, of consumer attention away from India toward China, or do the consumers really enjoy having a choice from either? Yeah, I'd say consumers like to have a choice, but that was a, a chapter of my dissertation, as a matter of fact, in that. Though the ability to move volumes of goods across the Tibetan Plateau into Nepal's northern areas, which happens to be up in this Himalayan range, presents a lot of challenges. There is certainly a much greater presence, a ubiquity of Chinese stuff there now, whether it's instant noodles or, or lots of beer or televisions and manufactured clothing, motorcycles, vehicles that hasn't that for a long time could enter Nepal outside of tax regimes, there wasn't necessarily uh, management over the import of these goods over the northern areas. Coming in from the south, shipped to Calcutta, and then overland into the marketplace of Nepal, much more highly regulated. But the, the, the appetite for and consumption of these Chinese goods has led to an increasing volume of them entering these northern border areas in large part a function of the new infrastructures that enable that, which has also led to a greater presence of the Chinese state, or I'm sorry, of the Nepali state in this region, because if you have all these goods, there's great opportunity for tax revenue. So there's all kinds of new border regimes, tax bureaucracies, import, export, and that then becomes a, another point of extraction or accumulation as a function of absolutely a, a wide presence of, of Chinese stuff in this area. And I think there's an appetite for, a greater appetite for some Chinese things over Indian things as a function of, of lower price that may be clothes and, and shoes and motorcycles and things that can get there more easily. But a lot of the food stuffs people whom I spent time with in, in Northern villages didn't really care much for Chinese rice or, or Chinese biscuits or Chinese soft drinks or Chinese beer, even though it was cheaper. It was viewed largely at, at, at that time, this was several years ago of inferior quality. So final question, Dylan. Yeah. Uh, Chung Chun, who's a a PhD student, okay. so, and he's asking about the triangular asymmetry between China, Nepal, and India, which you touch, touch upon in okay. your talk. So he's asking, is there a comparative investigation on BRI projects and comparing with Indian development interventions in uh, Nepal? And how does Nepal and China, uh, so how Nepal and China leverage BRI to balance the long-term Indian influence? Okay. Well, from a geopolitical as well as from Okay. A Can I just yeah, yeah, yeah. go up to see up, the top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there does seem to be a triangular asymmetry. <laughs> and I think year to year, um, it, thank you for this question. It, it's great. Um, a triangular asymmetry between China, Nepal, and India. Absolutely. And I think that asymmetry, the balance or lack thereof, shifts uh, quite frequently often with respect to the leading political party in Nepal, but also as far as what kind of um, projects BRI and otherwise are, are at points of contestation. I, I think of the um, Budi Gandaki hydropower project, which is viewed or it's, it's been imagined to be possibly uh, Nepal's, they borrow the, the Ethiopian um, Grand Renaissance Dam, you know, this absolutely 
tremendous transformative project that the contracts for this have gone back and forth between Indian developers and Chinese developers, depending on if it's Nepali Congress or, or communist or Maoist political leadership in Kathmandu. So there is certainly a triangulation of the geopolitical relationships that often are influenced or, or even articulated by the, the infrastructure projects at hand. So is there a comparative investigation on BRI projects and Indian development intervention in Nepal? Um, I would point actually to a, a good friend and colleague, Dinesh Padel, who's a, a associate professor of uh, development at Appalachian State University down in Boone, North Carolina, has done some excellent new work on, uh, on this uh, sort of the, 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 the shift in, in development practice in Nepal since the both investment and development since the 2015 earthquakes. And he has a new paper in Asia Development and Policy that looks very much at this, um, this what, what I think is, is the shift and probably provides useful comparative investigation there. And how Nepal and China leverage BRI to balance the long-term Indian influence. Uh, it, it's again, it's a, a work in progress, but it's something that I think the BRI has helped get much work done on, and it continues to progress as Nepal and, and India have um, their the geopolitical relations remain strained. And, and China and India are, by some observers, part of this, I hesitate to use the new Cold War, but their geopolitical tensions are exacerbated, I think, sometimes by the tremendous geoeconomic importance that these two states now assume and, and they wield. So um, I'm not sure if, I hope I at least in part, Cheng Chan, uh, was able to answer some of your questions there. But the, the comparative study, I would most uh, of all encourage you to, to look at Dinesh Padel's work. It, it, it's really excellent. 